a CBC Color presentation. Toronto always performed well. It became very personal. They were the enemy. I hate to lose. You wanted to win. We were expected to win. The rivalry was just so intense. You can't get tickets for those games. What a great tradition it was. That's what the fans like. It was a big rivalry. I think I would have been a good Montreal Canadian. Every kid want to play for the Leafs, and here every kid wants to play for the Canadians. We want to beat him, we want to beat him back. The rivalry was still there. And it's more than hockey team. We're such a part of the traditional history of hockey in Canada. Nothing matches the atmosphere when the Canadians play the Maple Leafs. It's still there in the hearts of the people. It was a great year to be a Canadian. The spring of 1967 brought with it a Stanley Cup final that few who were there will ever forget. Facing off are Canada's only two teams, the Toronto Maple Leafs and Montreal's Les Canadiens. Theirs was both the bitterest and the best of rivalries. I know they wanted the cup badly. A country's undivided attention. It was a year of Expo in Montreal. Everything was, was perfect. A clash of hockey cultures. We like to slow them down a little by the hitting part of it. In what will always be remembered as the final year of a 16 NHL. That's the beauty of sport. You never know what's, <laughs> what's going to happen. Hockey's most storied and decorated clubs together had carved a history of animosity on ice. But in the waning moments of the Stanley Cup of 1967, their rivalry was about to change forever. When the players shook hands that Tuesday night in May, none could have imagined what the future might bring. Maple Leafs Cliff Fletcher and Montreal's Ronald Corey are today's builders. The men charged with recapturing the magic and with maintaining what is a living piece of Canadiana in a country of dwindling institutions. Montreal has almost always known success. Winning has become the tradition. And so last year marked a rare departure for the team when it fired one of its icons, Serge Savard. 
with Serge, it was very difficult because, as I said, he did very well. <clears throat> but I thought, you know, I, I thought after the, uh, <clears throat> the season, the previous season, and last year, the, be the, the beginning of the season, I can see you know, that something was missing with the team. Savard was the loyal soldier. I did accept the decision because I, I was not the guy to call the shot. And I said it at my press conference, the only way not to be fired is to own the team to be like Harold Ballard, to make all the decisions. It was very difficult, no question about that. Difficult for him, difficult for me. But now, you know, the, I have a new group in place, and now we have to uh, rebuild and uh, win again. Today's team knows that success will be measured against the Canadiens' incredible record of 24 Stanley Cups. People who were be here before us, they, uh, they succeed uh, on the ice and off the ice. We feel the pressure that we have to succeed too. In rebuilding, the team looks to its recent past for Mario Tremblay to stand this time behind the fabled bench. There is some irony that on this tumultuous day in Montreal's history, the rival is Toronto. The game will be their last in the Montreal Forum. It used to be that 14 times a year the rivalry was renewed between Canada's two great teams waged in its two great arenas. Sadly, no more. 60 years of rivalry. A remarkable 35 Stanley Cups between them reduced to two games a year. Now comes the closing of the forum. But while the game may have changed, the past is not forgotten. The new Molson Center, built in the heart of Montreal, opens with the memories of the past and dreams of future glory. To commemorate the accomplishments of these two men, Maple Leafs have produced banners recognizing the honor. In Toronto, the Maple Leafs look to their past. I'm proud to be back in the Leaf organization. Uh, I think that uh, I can contribute uh, uh, to help uh, rebuilding the, uh, the image and the tradition that it has had. With its history rooted before the Great Depression, the Leafs are three decades removed from a championship. Their new president learned as a young boy the team's tradition and its role in hockey's greatest rivalry. I know as a youngster in my house in suburban Montreal, my father was a fanatical Montreal Canadian fan, so uh, when I'd sneak upstairs to the bedroom and turn on the Maple Leaf game with Foster Hewitt, I'd have to keep it down low because I wasn't allowed to listen to the Maple Leafs. <laughs> The Toronto story begins with Foster Hewitt's game calls at the old Mutual Street Arena. His play-by-play -play of the Toronto St. Pats inspired the legendary Con Smythe to buy the team and rename them the Maple Leafs. This was 1927. Smythe's vision was to build a Stanley Cup champion modeled on his own determined image. Smythe was, uh, was a very dominant person. Um, he could uh, he could singe a, a person with a glance. He had a manner uh, that attracted attention. Smythe was tough. So were his military-style training camps. He was flamboyant, using money won on a horse race to buy Ottawa's King Clancy. But would King play for Toronto? I'll play any place. I'll play any place. As long as I get what I want. Well, I said, uh, I don't want to offer you anything, but you're for sale, and I'm going to buy it. What do you want? He says, anything you give me, I'll play it. King Clancy's fire ignited the Maple Leafs. Other players were lured in an unlikely fashion. Connie Smythe came to me, and he said, uh, uh, Red, he says, you've had enough of this amateur hockey. He said, uh, we'd like you to come with us. I said, when do you want me? Well, he says, tonight. <laughs> with new players, Smythe and his assistant, Frank Selke, needed a new arena to play in. 
Maple Leaf Gardens was built in five months at the height of the Great Depression. First opened in November of 1931, the Gardens was hockey's showcase venue. It stands today as the game's last great arena. Many never set foot in the building, but knew it intimately through the words of Foster Hugh. Getting ready to start the second period, and there's no score. Toronto Maple Leafs, nothing. When traveling in the summer to Western Canada, the players soon discovered Foster's celebrity. Who do you think the, the first person that they wanted to see was Foster Hewitt. <laughs> he was the most popular <laughs> uh, man on the trip. Hewitt's support was cultivated by the Leaf owner. Smythe knew he was getting close. Well, they're doing the best they can, Foster, and whether they win or lose, they'll play like champions. Then the last piece. Coach Dick Irvin brought leadership in Smythe's style. Of last year or this year's edition. Well, I think this year's team is about the gamest bunch of athletes I ever had any connection with. All right, Jack, come on. Come on. As the opening season came to a close, the Leafs found themselves facing the Rangers in the 32 Cup Final. It was hard not to believe in Conn Smythe. His disciplines made the Leafs successful. The team won its first cup in the Garden's very first year. Smythe, Selkie and Irvin, the Leafs architects, would soon be at the heart of hockey's most bitter rivalry. And then Aurel Joliet, uh, he, he, he only weighed about 135 pounds all the, all the time he was in the league. But he was one of the best wingers in, wing players in the league. And he... Uh, he, he didn't have much hair, Joliet, and consequently he wore a baseball cap. And uh, the thing we tried to avoid was knocking off his baseball cap because he, he became ferocious when, when his baseball cap was knocked off. And, and it was seen to rouse the rest of the team even. So we said, now be careful about Harrell's baseball cap. Don't knock it off. <laughs> that was sort of a joke. The roots of Canadian hockey trace back to the late 19th century. Amateur play became widespread. The game's popularity moved through Montreal, Ottawa and Kingston before eventually finding its way up the St. Lawrence to Toronto. The Montreal Canadiens were formed in 1909, a local team for players of French descent. It wasn't long before the Forum was built, nor was it long before the first heroes emerged. There was Georges Vezina. And then came the legendary Howie Morenz. He had so much speed, uh, and he was so light in the skates, his blades would only hit the ice about every third stride, you know. He was just, just so fast, such a great adept stick handler. The Canadian swift skating style became fire wagon hockey. The team known as the Flying Frenchman. Personally, I enjoyed playing against the Canadians. Uh, they were smooth and, and uh, they were quick and, and they were dedicated. Uh, it just seemed to me that, uh, that, the, that the Canadian players were very proud to wear their uniforms. Toronto watched the Canadiens win three cups with Morenz. But in 1937, tragedy struck. Shortly after breaking his leg in the game, Morenz died in hospital. He rested at center ice in the Forum. Red Horner was a pallbearer that day. He was so loved by the fans that they, they just could hardly hold their excitement and their... their, their uh, feelings about him at that, at that funeral. It was, it was simply something that you never, re, never forget. His death marked a difficult time for hockey in Montreal. Though the Canadians drew in Toronto, the forum was almost empty. The Canadians were in deep trouble. Hockey in Montreal, very strange to say, they almost folded. Uh, 
the Maroons had folded a couple of years before that. Hockey interest was nil. The last regular season game that year, of a year when the Canadians won only 10 games, their worst season in history, Toronto played here in Montreal, and the crowd was about 1,500. Emile Bouchard was one of the young players recruited to revitalize the team. They were last in the league, and uh, they had all hockey players that uh, were uh, over the hill. The talented Toe Blake had come over when the Maroons folded. There was hope he would spark change. But the real bid to save the Canadiens came in 1940, when Montreal lured coach Dick Irvin away from the Maple Leafs. Going home in the car, my dad turned to me and says, do you think you could cheer for the Montreal Canadiens? Well, I mean, I had grown up Toronto Maple Leafs. You know, I was eight years old. How could I ever cheer for anybody but the Toronto Maple Leafs? Of course, he knew. Dick Irvin brought his reputation for hard work to Montreal. The practices were long and tough. Ken Reardon joined the team that year. They had just slipped so far, and uh, when Dick Irvin Sr. came in here, they didn't know what hit them. <laughs> he brought in just like an English sergeant major in the Army. And they very quickly, more, you know, within a period of four years from that time, uh, became the best team in the National League. Montreal-Toronto games took on new intensity. Brawls were common, some even involving Smythe, who saw the Canadiens as the enemy. Now ten years without a cup, Smythe's team was building around Sil Apps, a gifted athlete. The pass goes astray. Now Campman and Apps. Apps's Apps winger Bob Davidson noticed a change when playing in Montreal. Fans were different down there than they are in Toronto, so it was a world. It was a, a rivalry. And everybody wanted tickets to go and see us play, so it, was, it went over big. So big that by the spring of 42, the Leafs had surpassed Montreal and advanced to the cup final. Major Con Smythe was given special leave to address his players before the final period of the cup's seventh game. His talk inspired the team, but the celebration would be short. Smythe soon headed to Europe to lead men on the battlefield. He was very inspirational. He was a great disciplinarian, and he, and he had a good judge of men. He really did. And he was very, very tough, but he was very honorable. Many of his players, including Captain Sil Apps, followed Smythe to war. The depleted Leafs were hardly a match for Montreal anymore. Toronto the Good hated uh, the fact that the Canadians had uh, retained uh, these outstanding hockey players and that the, the Maple Leafs had gallantly gone off to war, leaving these uh, fuzz-faced boys to, to hold up the, the home forces. And uh, so when the Canadians came into Maple Leaf Gardens, uh, the fans wanted to see the bully crushed. So for the first time in the growing rivalry between Montreal and Toronto, Race and language became an issue. I mean, the club, there wasn't too many guys. That was during the war. There was, there was not too many players. Most of the players were going to the army, and I was lucky enough that I had all those injuries, and I was called for the army, and uh, uh, they gave me a discharge because I was in a cast. Montreal grew even stronger with Elmer Lack uniting with Richard and Toe Blake to form the famous Punchline. Dick Irvin went to Rocket after. He said, I don't know what you're so pleased about. He said, we won a game 9 nothing one night. And he said, I got all nine goals. So he said, Rocket, I don't know what you're... They're making such a fuss about you. And he was joking, you know, but he... he they respected him. He, he had done everything everybody else had done and probably done it better. Bob Davidson remembers being assigned to shadow the Rocket. He had those piercing eyes, <laughs> and uh, I didn't check him all the time, but I checked him most of the time, and uh, he, uh, he could uh, grab that loose puck and get let go and go and score a goal, no problem. Montreal fans didn't appreciate Davidson's style. I had my stick up over the boards, and I, the guy grabbed my stick and yanked it right out of my hand. Well, here I am, 
I'm looking at the referee and I think he's going to blow the whistle. He didn't blow the whistle at all. And the Rocket went in and scored. I think he scored five goals after that. <laughs> the seeds of rivalry were being sown. With each club getting stronger, Toronto fans would push their Leafs to beat Montreal. And we used to play a good game in Toronto. The fan used to cheer us and uh, they used to boo Toronto because they were playing bad. So it was the same thing here in Montreal. We tried not to play bad hockey, we tried to win all the time. A fact well known to the playoff bound Leafs. The Canadians had a great team. I think they lost five games all year. Something like that, you know, maybe tied about six or seven. But they only lost five games. So they just annihilated us in the playoffs. They've knocked us out four straight. The champions didn't lose a single playoff game in the spring of 44. The following autumn, the humiliated Leafs wanted revenge. During the regular season, there was great, great, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't say animosity, but there was great rivalry between Montreal and Toronto. The tie when Montreal played Toronto was no way. They had a say in a tie, is like kissing your sister. And that's the, what it was when you played Toronto. The Leafs made it to the playoffs only to face Montreal and the Rocket, who that year had scored 50 goals in 50 games. During that year, Dick Irwin had proclaimed that that Montreal Canadian team was the greatest team that had ever played in the National Hockey League up till that time. And we knocked them off in six games. Depleted by the war, clearly the underdog, the Leaf victory in 1945 remains one of their great triumphs. It was phenomenal that we won. I, we, Bob Davidson and I get together at times and we still chuckle how we ever uh, beat the Canadians <laughs> with the great team they had. The surprising Leafs went on to defeat the Detroit Red Wings in seven games to win the Stanley Cup. Canadian history was in the making. That, I think, was really the start of the rivalry. I think it was the mid-40s, because in 1945, the Canadians had their big year. And through the late 40s and early 50s, the rivalry was very intense. The Leafs and Canadians were now hockey's best teams. For six straight years, one of the two would win the Stanley Cup. certainly uh, impressed when I went into the Maple Leaf dressing room for the first practice and uh, I recall very well because living in a small town uh, you, uh, you, I wore up I had a uh, which I thought was a lovely parka and I walked in the Maple Leaf Gardens it was a snowy day too in early March and one of the Leaf players and they're all in, in uh, over suits, suits and overcoats even though it was a practice and one of them said to me, he says, um, is that the kind of uh, clothes they wear down in Fort Culver? And I said, oh yeah, sure, you know, not thinking. But on the way back to where I was living in the, on the uh, streetcar, I thought, he was just being very subtle, but he was letting me know that Maple Leaf hockey players don't come to practice or anywhere else and just park us. Frank Selke was fed up with Con Smythe. When they rebuilt the Canadians, though, they brought Dick Irvin, and then they brought in Frank Selke Sr. They both were here in Toronto, and they both left and went down to Montreal. This team became the Toronto Maple Leafs. Every bit the enemy, Selke was intent on beating the Leafs. Smythe was equal to the task. In 1946, the rivalry was on. He just... Uh, just didn't want to lose to the Montreal Canadiens, and so he let us he let us know at, at all times. Selkie and Smythe, they, they did not like each other, and we didn't like the players either. They wanted to build a club that uh, would beat the Toronto Maple Leafs, and uh, I think the rivalry started actually back when Frank Selkie went down there. Selkie and Irvin were reunited. They instilled regimen where there had been none. They built a farm system, and from it, Came one of the greatest teams ever. Out of there came Ballyville, Jeffrey, 
Dickie Moore, Saint Laurent, Goyette, Marshall, Plum, all came from Mr. Selkie's foresight. Selkie knew he was lucky to have the rocket. Smythe tried several times to buy him, but Selkie knew the fans would tear down the forum brick by brick. Richard loved scoring against the Leafs. Clancy told us the rocket walked up, up to him and he says, Hey, King! He says, uh, don't give that kid hell for that bad pass. He says, I do that all the time. <laughs> The Montreal-Toronto rivalry reached new extremes. When we played Toronto, here we were. We, the, we are the French, they were the English. Richard versus Ezenicki. We supposedly are Catholics, which I happen to be one playing the Protestants. Reardon versus Apps. And also it was Quebec versus Ontario. Bouchard versus Kennedy. It was a legitimate rivalry, a real hate. The Canadians were declared the enemy. The Leafs attacked with military precision. In 1947, Toronto defeated Montreal in six games to win their fourth Stanley Cup. Smythe's Leafs won a game in 1948. Conn Smythe's tirades and maneuvers kept interest high in Toronto. He threatened to drop netminder Turk Broda unless he lost weight, and earlier had traded five players for Chicago's Max Bentley. Smythe's iron-fisted approach continued to produce results. As Mr. Smythe said, uh, when you're on that ice, you don't say hello to the guy in front of you. If he caught you talking to him <laughs> on the ice, <laughs> when the game was over, he'd come in and tell you, hey, that cost you 50 bucks. Toronto-Montreal hockey became rough and mean. And from it came one of the longest and most bitter disputes. Cal Gardner and Ken Reardon felt its lingering effects. I, somebody cross-checked me across the mouth. I had cut him on the lip. We were fighting for a playoff spot. There was a, quite a bit of blood on the ice, and uh, my chewing gum, we all chewed gum and fall on the ice, and I could see a couple of teeth sticking in it. And all of a sudden, one night, he gives me the elbow and breaks my jaw. Uh, I wanted to get even. I, it's, uh, I make no bones about it. He had already told uh, a magazine that he was going to break my job. And the week the magazine came out, I ran into Cal Gardner accidentally. I never got a penalty, and unfortunately, he broke his jaw off both sides. It was an awful crack. To, that's an awful thing to do to a man. So I had to go in front of Mr. Campbell, and I got a real strict talking to, and uh, he didn't fine me $1,000. He made me post a bond of $1,000. Today, nearly 50 years later, I wouldn't talk to him. I wouldn't lower myself to talk to him. If I'd played one more year, I would have had one more go, I think, because $1,000 is not that much money. This was the rivalry that marked the post-war era. In 1951, the Leafs and Canadiens met again in the finals. All five games went into sudden death overtime. The Maple Leafs winning their fourth cup in five years on Bill Barilko's memorable goal. Barilko was mobbed by his teammates after the goal. Sadly, it would be his last. That summer, Barilko disappeared in a plane crash. The tragedy weighed heavily on the Maple Leafs. The advent of television in the early 50s brought Hockey Night in Canada into every Canadian home. Foster Hewitt's images created on radio came to life. Coinciding with the arrival of television were a new generation of stars. It was a, a good learning for a young fellow to come up and, and have the opportunity to, to learn from the, the, the real veterans of hockey. 
you know, Big Butch would take you aside if you did something wrong. I know he helped me tremendously take me aside and say, Dickie, you don't say that or you don't do this. Jean Beliveau was barely a teenager when word of his prowess spread. The young Beliveau played several years with Punch Imlac's Quebec Aces before Frank Selke was able to sign him. Imlac called him the best player he ever coached. Beliveau was acutely aware of the demands awaiting him. I think fans of Montreal were expecting so much. And I had the feeling that whatever I was doing, uh, it was never enough. Then there was Bernie Jeffrion, who later matched Richard's 50 goals. And Jacques Plante, who won five straight Vezina trophies. Montreal grew so strong, they reached the cup final an amazing 10 years in succession. In 1953, the Canadians defeated Boston to win their first of six cups in the 50s. It seemed Montreal's success would run uninterrupted. Until that infamous night in March 1955. He left his stick up in my face and he cut me over below the nose and on the side and I started to run after him. Richard swung his stick wildly at Boston's Hal Laco. I had a linesman that was from Boston holding me from behind. The rocket hit the linesman in his bid to get free. Uh, Laco was swinging at me, so uh, the third time when I turned around, he was beside the board, and I just pushed him there and turned around and hit him. When it was done, so was Richard. Richard will be suspended from all games the suspension was harsh, even by today's standards. Fans were outraged. Both Richard and NHL President Clarence Campbell attended Montreal's first game after the verdict. Barely a period of hockey was played that night. The forum evacuated. What ensued on the streets of Montreal has long been the debate of sociologists and historians. Suffice to say, for the Canadians, hope for the season was ended. For Maurice Richard, the moment is never forgotten, nor forgiven. I had Campbell in my, in my mind and I, I, I didn't like him very much, so I, I never, I spoke to him a few times after that, but that was all I said. You were wrong. I think you were not alone to just suspend it. Toronto had its own troubles. The 50s marked a steady decline for the Leafs. Not even the fire of King Clancy's coaching could rouse the team in the wake of the Morocco tragedy. The Leafs developed some good young players but failed to make it beyond the playoffs first round. By contrast, Montreal was rich in talent. With Toe Blake now behind the bench, another leader was about to emerge. Toe Blake finally asked a few of us, he said, am I, am I seeing right? Is a kid that good? Henri Richard was a teenager just working out with the club. I went up to Mr. Selke and uh, Morris came with me because I, I, I couldn't speak a word of English. So he said, don't come up. He came up with me. And yeah, Mr. Selke asked uh, uh, my brother Morris if you think Henry is ready to play with Monday or the big team. Morris said, sure, he's ready. And he walked out and he made me sign a contract. I didn't know what I signed. And, I didn't know, even know the, the amount of money that I was getting, and I just signed and left. <laughs> the Richards, along with Beliveau, Moore, and Jeffreyon, would unite under Toe Blake to form hockey's greatest dynasty. Blake knew full well the abilities of his players, but ensured each understood the team came first. A great hockey player is just like a great artist, and a great artist has this tendency to be an individual. 
But if you put those great artists together, uh, I think that's what makes a championship. Toe Blake was the man who would mold this greatness. When he joined us, he said, listen, I, what can I tell you guys? He saw the greatness of the team that he was going to take over. When we won our first Stanley Cup with him in 55, you know, there was no end. He said, I told you so. You know? Uh, Connie Smack, when he used to come to Montreal, he used to sit beside my wife in, uh, on top of the exit and, where, and behind the Toronto Maple Leaf bench. And she, he used to talk to my wife. He, he told her many times that he would like to get, the, to get me to play for the Maple Leaf, but uh, the trade never came, so I, uh, it was in the paper a few times. And uh, there was a picture, the, the, the Trump, uh, Toronto photograph uh, had a picture in the paper uh, with a maple leaf sweater on, but he took only my face. I never wore the one that took a maple leaf sweater. Selkie's Quebec system yielded a continuous supply of talent. We had so much power. We had that big man on the blue line, Doug Harvey. Bert Olmstead and Jeffrey Owen. Rocket Rocket and Dickie Moore. Butch Bouchard. John Little, my brother and more is out blown. We dominated the league at the time, so Toronto, we, we kind of had them under, our, uh, under control. The Canadians moved to the top of the standings in the 50s, while the Leafs struggled just to make the playoffs. The Habs' Cup win of 57 was the second of five in succession. Montreal was delirious with excitement when their team captured its third in a row, equaling the Leafs' Cup run of the 40s. Canadians' fans grew more demanding. We expected every year to go out and win the league and win the Stanley Cup. If things were going bad, you didn't want to walk down St. Catherine Street because the people would be bugging you a little. You'd be walking down the back alleys or you'd stay home. A new era was beginning in Toronto. In the fall of 58, after missing the playoffs two years straight, the Leafs hired little-known George Imlach as assistant GM. The new man went about proving himself. Not too many people really knew that much about Punch. At least, certainly, I, I didn't know that much, and I think most of the guys that uh, were playing on the team at that time really didn't know what Punch was all about. Punch Imlach was a driven man. With less than half a season in the organization, he had become GM and coach. Imlach was outspoken and profane. He pushed his players hard. The youngest responded, and the team found new heights. That was the year when we made the playoffs on the final game of the year. We were the Cinderella team of hockey, and we made it right through to the finals against the awesome Montreal Canadiens. We went out in four straight, but nevertheless, we were the team that wasn't supposed to be there, but we we're certainly a team of destiny. When the Leafs met the Canadians in the spring of 59, the rivalry was reawakened. They hated each other, you know, and I used to sit in the dressing room and listen to the other players say, look, at, they really have to be up against Montreal because they had a powerhouse. Montreal won their fourth cup in succession. Imlac ensured each player knew his objective. And as I went out the door, he said, we have to face Canadians if we're going to win the Stanley Cup. He says, we're going to have to beat him. And he said, we need somebody to check Tullivo. And he said, that's what, I think you're the final piece in a championship team, he said, I think. And that's your, going to be your role. When the teams met again in the 60 Cup final, the Leafs had a strong young lineup imbued with Imlac's mission to beat Montreal. Bob Davidson did a great job at developing young players. And uh, along with some older players, Alan Stanley, Tim Horton, and Johnny Bauer, uh, it kind of uh, knitted into a real solid team. Still, Toronto was no match for the Canadians in a series that would be the Rockets' last. A pass intercepted by Maurice Richard. Maurice Richard passed it right in front of the net. Moore took a whack at it. Maurice Richard right in front of the net. Maurice Richard's final career goal capped the Canadian's fifth straight triumph. Richard always appreciated the Toronto fans' support.
It's always nice to win the cup outside of Montreal, and the best place to win it is driving here in Toronto. Because... Imlac knew Montreal was his only obstacle. This is the team I've got to beat, and I, that's, uh, that's the objective of all your work, is to win the Stanley Cup, and if it has to be the Canadians, well, then it has to be the Canadians. During the 1961 season, Imlac was certain his was the best team in hockey. Everything the Leafs undertook was done with one intention in mind, to beat the mighty Canadians. The question was whether Imlac was the man to lead them there. Punch was uh, a great, I think one of the best general managers. I wouldn't call him a coach. Uh, I think it was the power of uh, the people that he had within the organization when he came. But people in the organization were changing. Con Smythe turned the reins of the Leafs over to his son Stafford and a committee known as the Silver Seven. Stafford Smythe was a good hockey man. His instincts suggested punch Imlac for the Maple Leafs. Imlac proved him right by adding quality players to the team Smythe had sculpted. Stafford Smythe was impressed by Punch's determination, but knew Imlac could be abrasive. That's the way he was, and he felt, that's all teach you. If you want to play hockey for me, you got to be a, an Imlac player, and that's the way uh, a lot of us were. And there's a lot of players who didn't like Punch. They, had, they were, had a lot of disagreements with him. Bauer was one of those players intimidated by Imlac. And John, you know, Punch, uh, just lorded that over him all the time pension plan and, and staying with the Leafs. And all Johnny wanted was 10 years in the pension plan. And, uh, and, and, and Punch thought that was funny, and it wasn't funny. Chicago surprised both Toronto and Montreal in 61. But the following spring, the Maple Leafs returned to the cup final and beat the Hawks in six games. It was Imlac's first Stanley Cup. Toronto and Montreal had been expected to meet in the final, but Chicago upset the Canadians. While Imlac and the Leafs were visibly united in celebration, there was a growing tension between the coach and his players. As soon as I started having success, and they tried to put a ceiling on what a player should make, we had a lot of problems. Imlac's dressing room was not always a happy place. It didn't help when an astronomical million dollar offer for the Big M was rumored. I received a phone call from my dad waking me up in the morning saying that I was sold to Chicago for a million and uh, I had to check with the paper if it was a hundred thousand or a million. I wasn't too <laughs> sure in the uh, zeros. Uh, I never made anywhere near the money that I was worth. Punch Imlac and Toe Blake first met as opposing coaches in the old Quebec Senior League. They brought the rivalry from the ice to behind the benches. Both were very uh, good coaches because they knew uh, the, uh, the capacity of each of their men. Although publicly cordial, animosity developed. That's when he has all his skills. I hate agreeing with you, Punch, but this one time, I think you're right. Imlac's distaste for the Canadians became so intense that he was disappointed to be facing Montreal in the first round of the 63 playoffs. He wanted to beat them in the final. Over the line with Vicky Moore, takes his shot, Bauer kicks that out. The Leafs won in five games, the series underscoring the intense competition between Blake and Imlac. Punch had great respect for Toe, but at the time, the feeling was not mutual. Toe didn't have the same admiration for him. <laughs> so when I came back, I used to say, Toe, he really thinks a lot of you. <laughs> Toe didn't care one bit. Toronto won their second straight cup, beating Detroit in five quick games. Imlac's popularity with the media and fans soared. Well, I don't know how I got the, the tag as a miracle man. I just do my job and uh, I just have to be a little lucky, that's all. Under Imlac, ticker tape parades seemed the norm. Leaf fans were getting accustomed to success again. 
In the 64 playoffs, the intensity of the rivalry grew. It didn't matter whether you were sick or you were tired. You went out and you played the game of your life, and there never has been and never will be an experience greater than a Toronto Maple Leaf in a Montreal Canadiens hockey game. The shadow cast by the late 50s hardened the resolve of the Canadians. Both go down heavily. Play got rough. Ferguson now being bumped by Brewer. The teams were going end to end in reckless abandon. Almost up in the Hodge. Hodge took a swipe at Bathgate with his stick. The semi-final went to a seventh game. Dave Keon scored all three goals in a 3-1 Leafs win. as well as I, that there's a great rivalry. There's a lead pass to Keon. Keon is going in a goal. He's picking scores! We like to play well against the Canadians because they're a great hockey team. And scores! And we have to play our very best to, to beat them. The two teams were in the midst of sharing an amazing 13 cups in 14 years. Toronto was greeted by Gordie Howe and the Red Wings. Facing elimination, Leaf hopes were sparked by a twist of fate. Bob Bond's overtime goal was scored on a broken leg. Bond left the game on a stretcher but with his leg frozen, returned. His dramatics led to a third cup. There was joy that night, but smiles masked an undercurrent of unhappiness. It was an ongoing battle with Punch Imlac. I didn't agree with his methods, I didn't agree with his approach to hockey, and I didn't agree, agree with his unnecessary disciplines, because if he required disciplines of us, he should have demanded the same things of himself. As the victorious Leafs closed the season, there was a foreboding sense about what lay ahead. It's one of my greatest joy, and at the same time, one of my greatest surprise that morning, when uh, Toe came back after the secret vote, and he shook hands with me, and he said, boys, here's your new captain. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I knew uh, Boom uh, was very upset. Uh, uh, you had uh, Dickie Moore, Tom Johnson, and Jeffrey Young as the three alternate. And I've uh, been uh, roommate with Boom for 11 years. Uh, and uh, and uh, I remember going to see Mr. Selke after a few days. I said, Mr. Selke, I said, me, you know, that's the team. I never expected uh, to be named captain. If, they, if this is going to upset, me, it's the good of the team. Give it to anybody. He said, I said, I cannot go to the room and uh, tell the boys that their, their choice is wrong. So that's their decision. If some players are upset, uh, they'll get uh, over with. And it took a, a day or two and uh, uh, kept on roommate with Boom, and <laughs> we've been friends uh, all along. <laughs> As the 64 season got underway, the Canadians' front office made a significant change. At 72, Frank Selke retired and was succeeded by Sam Pollock. 
discipline with Sam Pollock was very, very strict. And if you if you did do it, it uh, doesn't matter who, who you were, you were gone. Pollock had been with the Habs nearly 20 years, training under Selkie. The Canadians, uh, you know, being a, a uh, very famous organization, uh, there's always a, a great deal of uh, apprehension when uh, uh, you take over a, a team like that. To succeed again, the Canadians needed to counteract the Leafs' checking. I think we were uh, physically manhandled by the Leafs as part of their of their win. The new Canadians got bigger and stronger. John Ferguson was the lightning rod. Yeah, I want to be the meanest son of a bitch that ever put on a pair of skates. Toughening up produced results. I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but uh, starting in 65, we started to win Stanley Cup again. Toronto was knocked off in a six-game semi-final. Montreal went on to beat Chicago. There were new heroes, but many familiar faces. John Bellico was named the spring's most valuable player. Montreal in May was a game as it should be. By the fall of 65, the Canadians were comfortable with their newfound strength. They would go on to finish first. Imlac's Leafs, meanwhile, were dogged with problems. Brewer walked out. I felt that I could no longer go on with uh, Punch Imlac. There were others who felt differently, and uh, they, they, they really didn't pay any attention to Punch Imlac, whereas uh, he got to me, and he got to Frank Mahowicz, and he got to Michael Walton, and he, uh, he destroyed our psyches. Stress took its toll on Frank Mahovlich. I, I don't think I really uh, reached my peak here in, uh, in Toronto the way I, I should have developed. And it was a style that he played, and uh, I thought we worked too hard. Uh, there wasn't anything left for me to give come game time. With Brewer gone and his team in disarray, Imlac was in the stands as Tobleg's Canadians captured Montreal's 14th Cup in the spring of 66. There was little reason to suspect they wouldn't win again next year. Sam Pollock now had two cups in two years. Nineteen sixty-seven was Canada's centennial. Expo in Montreal. The city wanted a cup to celebrate. A trophy case lay waiting in Quebec's pavilion. After surviving Punch Imlac's late-season illness, the veteran Maple Leafs were determined to ruin Montreal's festivities. We were the over-the-hill gang, you know, and nobody gave us a chance because most of us were getting up in age. In fact, we knew it was going to be our last, uh, last whack at the cup. You're looking at a team with some, some great hockey players, so like Frank Mahovlich, George Armstrong, John Ferguson, Stemkowski, Bellevue, well, Sawchuck, Yvonne Cornoyer, Johnny Bauer, Pocket Rocket, Mahovlich, Dickie Duff, Eddie Shack, John Ferguson, Tim Horton, Bob Pulford. I mean, this was a real good hockey team. The series would feature Punch Imlac in the showdown with his rival, Toe Blake. Punch and Toe were going at each other all the time just to make the pot boil. They put on a better show than the players did. They were terrific. Imlac made light of rookie goaltender Rogi Vashon. Punch says, they'll never beat me with a junior B goaltender. I said, whoa, ho, ho, hold it. Punch, you know what you just said, said? He says, yes, I know what I said. When the series began in Montreal, most of Canada was watching. The Leafs and Canadians had met 14 times during the season. They knew one another well. Understandably, no one gave much thought to next year's expansion when the teams would play less often. It became a very, very special year, and I don't think we realized it at the time. As time has gone on, I, I look back and say, wow, that was the final series of the old six-team league. Montreal ran roughshod over the Leafs in game one, 
their contempt for Toronto fueling determination. Those are the main police, and uh, we just had to beat them. One night we're in George's Spaghetti House, and and uh, Eddie Shack came in and sat down at the next table. I hadn't even got my steak yet. I threw 20 bucks in, on the table and got up and walked out. And that's that's how it was. When the media and fans had written off his team, Imlach boldly announced the Leafs would win the series. Johnny Bauer replaced Terry Sawchuck for game two. Bauer withstood a barrage of attacks from John Ferguson. A 43-year-old shutout even the series. Emotions were high as the final moved to Toronto. Game three went into overtime. Bob Holford scoring after almost 30 extra minutes. There was heightened interest in the Centennial Series now that the Leafs appeared competitive with the powerful Canadians. A big surprise, Terry Sachak has been selected to start in goal, one of Hunch's hunches. Imlach's hunch was determined in the warm-up. Johnny Bauer had pulled the muscle and couldn't go on. Sachak, the late replacement. The Canadians had outplayed Toronto, yet prayed. They became desperate. Fights ensued. And I was cocky in those days. I'd go by the bench and and Nimlock, of course, was coaching, and I'd send, send your big guy out, Punch. John Ferguson, uh, he was a tough, tough. He, he, he could fight as well as anyone today. If I saw Shack on the ice, it was pure mayhem. When you got on with him, you, you held on, and then when you get a shot to get, if you get a good shot in, then you would get a good one in. The series was even. Blake and Imlach knew the fifth game was critical. The checking was tight, and both teams sought a hero. It was the fifth game in Montreal, and Eddie Shack comes in the room and come on, Frank, you know, he gets, starts giving me a pep talk, and I bring up the point, well, Eddie, I said, in a game like this, anybody can score. Anybody was Marcel Ponover, whose goal put the Leafs one win from the cup. Imla didn't want to return to Montreal. The Leafs would have to win at home. Even though they had outplayed the Maple Leafs, the Canadians sensed the series slipping away. We blew it. You know, we were sure to win it, but I, I guess our mind was not there. The heavily favored Canadians were shocked. They make us realize that you don't win a, a Stanley Cup before you, you have it win on the ice. Toronto's goaltending was the key. I've always felt that uh, Johnny Bauer and Terry Sachuk really beat us. In the final minute, Toronto led by a goal. Puck is dropped. Kelly, up to Cooper. Cooper gets left Armstrong. Armstrong waits. Takes the dead goal! George Armstrong's empty net goal closed the unlikeliest of seasons for Toronto. What the Leafs did was an upset, and it was really something, and I think it was marvelous. For many Leafs, it is the rivalry's most vivid moment. And I said, all right, what happened in 67? Eh? By the way, you had the champagne and everything. You had the convertibles all ready to go. And what happened? All right, by the way. <laughs> I tell you, every time I meet Eddie Shack, he, he, tell it, he reminds me of, remember 1967, they went on and beat us. It's a big joke. We have a lot of fun about that. The 67 Stanley Cup was the end of an era for hockey and its players. They loved the game. Uh, that's what I, I really appreciate so much about having an opportunity to play three years in the old 16 league. To see the quality of the character of the players that played at that time. We didn't make the money you make the players make today. They, the players were there because they loved the game. It was their greatest triumph. It's the thing I think a captain of Montreal, they were so sure they were going to win it, they had the Stanley Cup and the Quebec Pavilion of the Expos. And when we won, they had to take it out and put it in the Ontario one. And of course, I loved that. As soon as we arrived,
ride the Royal York and, and come into the games and, and um, I'd, I'd, we'd go for the morning skate and the morning talk and get our skates done. I'd come by and I'd stop at the, at the stock exchange at that time on Young Street and, and I'd go in and, the, and all the, <laughs> the brokers on the floor, I'd, I'd be up in the balcony and then the booze would start. And, I really get them pumped up, and uh, the Montreal Canadiens come into town to play the Maple Leafs. It was, uh, it was. I loved it. There was nothing better. And uh, I'd walk down Young Street, even in the summertime when I'd I come into Toronto, and and uh, always someone said hello, and uh, I could stir them up in Maple Leaf Gardens. That's I always wanted to do that. This is the year of the great expansion. The six new franchises were stocked with players from existing clubs. The Leafs lost 15 players in all, six off the cup winning team. There were other changes, some surprising. There was a deal made last night and just five minutes ago, Detroit had the chance to... That's the first I ever knew about uh, the talks. In a seven-player deal, Frank Mahovlich became a Red Wing. I felt great. I mean, it's something I wanted, and uh, it felt like a load off my shoulders. You know, let me out of here because uh, uh, it's. I, I was having problems like uh, since '61 uh, with the team, so um, it, it just felt it's about time. It was the sudden firing of Punch Jim Lack as general manager and coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs. The Leafs slid so far, so fast, that former Miracle Man Imlac was replaced. Jim Gregory took over. After several meetings, we determined that we would try to pretty much uh, see if we could uh, stay with the same team we had. Seeking revenue, the Leafs sold their two major farm teams. We did get badly hurt. Our top uh, players in our farm system were gone, and we, we really ended up with a very depleted farm system. The Canadians, under the watchful eye of Sam Pollock, were prepared for expansion, something Pollock actively supported. Not only did he run the Montreal Canadiens organization, he ran the National Hockey League. He'll deny it, but anybody who was around at the time and I was, knows that Sam Pollock ran the National Hockey League. Under new rules, the universal draft ended farm systems. Yet, Montreal was able to protect two Quebec juniors. But the story uh, gets told around, and what's a fact is, is two different things. The Canadians did have the choice of the first two French players, but that was only for a period of five years. Unlike Toronto, Montreal thrived in the draft. They worked hard finding successors to their veterans. New stars emerged. I was 14, I was 15 years old when I signed that C form, and which attached me with the Montreal Canadiens, and I, which at that time gave me $100 a year. And I was really proud to, have, uh, you know, to, to sign that. Serge Savard was a key contributor as Montreal beat Scotty Bowman's Blues a team staffed with former Habs. They won the first two post-expansion cups. Montreal had now captured four Stanley Cups in five years. By the early 70s, the Canadians sought a former Leaf, Frank Mahovlich, to bolster their lineup. I think the greatest ad that we, we, we had in those years was Frank Mahovlich. Uh, Frank Mahovlich, you know, give us that edge. The Big M joined his brother Peter. I felt just great. I felt uh, uh, as good as anybody playing with the Montreal Canadiens. I fitted right in. I could understand why they won so many championships. And would continue to win. You know, people ask me what's the best game you ever saw. What's the best? I haven't got a best game or a best series because I've seen so many great ones. But I've got a best year and it was 1971. The odds were, you know, way against us because they had such a powerhouse. We were on the dock against Boston, of course, uh, no way. Kenny was just phenomenal in the net. He stopped everything. 
have to go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest triumph of the Canadians. After all, we finished in third place that year. I don't know how many points behind Boston. Backed by Ken Dryden's play, the Canadians upset Boston and went on to win the Cup. But for the first time in its modern history, there was public controversy within the team. Coach Al McNeil had benched Captain Henri Richard. I was unhappy. I wanted to play. You know, I, I'm not saying now that it's finished. And he might have been right, but I didn't feel he was right then. I wanted to play. I was getting paid to play hockey, and I wanted to play. And I said he was the worst coach that I ever played for. The matter took on political overtones. When uh, Henry uh, don't play enough, it's not because he don't speak French or English, because we speak both, we got no problem. When you want to win the Stanley Cup, there's no language. In storybook fashion, Richard came off the bench to score twice, including the winner in the seventh game. But the issue of language would not go away. I felt a little sorry about saying that because it, they start they start to do it, uh, trying to get a language and English, French, and which I'd never thought about. Once the applause left Montreal, so did Al McNeil. I talked to Sam about it after the move was made. I said, how can you do this, Sam? I mean, this guy won a Stanley Cup for you. He said, well, I said, how can you demote the guy to the, to the minor? He said, I, I didn't demote him. He said, I shuffled the cabinet. And that's it. End of story. That's Sam Pollock. That's why he was so great. In Toronto, Harold Ballard and Stafford Smythe were great friends. Together, they took control of Maple Leaf Gardens, making themselves and their shareholders wealthy. But John Bassett resigned in disgust as the pursuit of money came at the expense of the hockey club. The Maple Leafs never recovered from the pair's folly. Tradition became lost in the carnival air. Ads were put all through the place. Down came the picture of the Queen. Down came Foster's uh, revered gondola. Uh, down came the great pipe organ. And uh, uh, every nook and cranny was uh, explored for the possibility of seats. In 1972, Ballard was convicted on 47 counts of fraud. Stafford Smythe had died a year earlier prior to facing trial. Ballard served a year in prison. Outside the, uh, the humiliation and the disgrace, it wasn't bad because I had a, I, you know, I had a pretty good time down there at uh, Mill Haven. I had my own room. Young Leafs like Darrell Sittler felt Ballard mishandled hockey matters. He was very uh, against the world hockey and what they were costing him and in uh, salary escalations and he basically made up his mind that uh, for an extra five thousand bucks he was going to let a guy go and he wouldn't pay the the players where the montreal canadians back then i think they saw the the future and ballard appeared to have little interest in spending money to make his hockey club better did harold uh, sacrifice winning uh, i don't think he did he wanted to win i think uh, the more you win the more chance you have of being front and center which was important to him the players became disenchanted by Ballard's callousness. It really bothered me when uh, some of the decisions that were made upstairs were not for the, for, for the team for, or for the fans. Uh, some, some, it looked like it was personal. Ballard's questionable practices took their toll. If my wife was here, she would say, uh, yeah, at the end, end of the season, uh, Ron was whipped f physically, but mentally was even worse. You just, um, you really go through a, a, bad, a bad time. Arriving in 1973 as coach, Red Kelly quickly understood the Leafs' rapid demise. They did the opposite of what uh, Montreal Canadiens would do. They didn't take money, they uh, traded their players for future draft picks. And of course they were always, you know, up in the top, whereas Toronto got the money, or they didn't get the players. Then they were in the draft, so in, in effect, Toronto was almost like an expansion team, really. Harold Ballard's lack of foresight cost the Maple Leafs dearly. You didn't know what was going to happen. You dealt with things as they came up. But, you know, uh, I also 
think that he, uh, he's been blamed for a lot of things. Most of the hockey decisions went through the hockey people. We, there were things that we did have some trouble with. I think that uh, if there's blame, it has to be shared, certainly by the people, including myself, who were making the decisions. But the blame ultimately belonged to Ballard. Kelly and Gregory managed to improve Leaf fortune somewhat in the 70s. But the Stanley Cup kept finding its way to Montreal. Still, that game has all the electricity for the players. And if you follow back in the history, very seldom is a game between the, uh, between the Maple Leafs and the Canadians a runaway. It's always a highly competitive and emotional game. And you know the other interesting about it, for the most part, they're clean hockey games. Uh, what, a, what a great tradition it was. What a marvelous experience. And, I, and as I'm leaving, I hope that I have contributed to make this foundation and strengthen this foundation for those who are going to follow. In the summer of 71, the torch was passed to Guy Lafleur. From the Quebec Ramparts, Guy Lafleur. If I look back, it was tough, very, very tough uh, on myself to uh, uh, go there every day and say, well, I'm going to do my best in the practice. I was working very, very hard, but I didn't know what would happen the next day if I was playing or not. The transition to the NHL was a struggle for Lafleur. The expectation of greatness crushing. It was just too much pressure on him, uh, and I think it was more or less uh, he, he himself didn't have the confidence that he could replace uh, Jean Beliveau. Lafleur took three seasons to find his stride. The Canadians, meanwhile, could wait. They were hockey's best team. In 1973, Montreal lost only ten games on its way to winning another Stanley Cup. Guy Lafleur looked up for inspiration. When you're sitting in the dressing room uh, by yourself uh, and you look up the wall to see all the uh, Hall of Famer, uh, with, uh, we threw the torch at you, uh, it's up to you to uh, hold it uh, I, you know, it's all these words and all the faces that was surrounding uh, the room makes, was making you realize, you know, uh, how important uh, that team was to the fans. Many will argue the Montreal teams of the 70s were the greatest ever. The Canadians would win four cups in succession. Nine players from those teams are now in the Hall of Fame. So too is the coach from that era, Scotty Bowman. Scotty uh, was told Blake all over again once he got behind that Canadians bench. The one thing that everybody in the team could agree on they could, both, everybody could sit down and say, "Well, geez, you know, I really hate Scotty." Even myself, I didn't, I didn't like Scotty, especially the first three years. After that, I didn't care. Through time, the players came to respect Bowman's demeanor. He just kept the tension off all of the other players and put it right up, right upon himself. And and that's that's a pretty tough burden to bear, uh, going on the ice and knowing that you've got 20 players that that don't really like you that much. Bowman's secret was to know the limit of each of his players. I think the kind of players we had, they wanted to be pushed. And uh, I just seemed to take it that if we didn't push them, they wouldn't be as good as they really could be. They were a very hungry team. Bowman won five cups in eight years with Montreal. Guy Lafleur blossomed. And others found stardom as the Canadians succeeded. The reason they were so good is they were very unselfish. Even though they were big stars and winning, the individual trophies didn't mean a thing to them. The 70s were not nearly so kind to the Maple Leafs. There were many new faces, new coaches, new hopes, while the team improved slowly. A decade of losing continued. The unfortunate thing, I guess, in the 70s, from a, a hockey standpoint, the Canadians went on and won cups, the Leafs didn't. The teams met in the playoffs in 1978 for the first time since 67. Do I 
unrivaled rivalry in Canadian sport, and they'll continue it. But the magic was fading for the Habs. It was not, uh, you know, the the big rivalry uh, of of the '60s, and uh, you know, it's really unfortunate because all of the fans were into it. Both the fans and the Maple Leafs wanted to believe that the rivalry was still alive. And there's something special about playing in the Forum, just the history and the tradition and the, the greatness of their teams. But at the same time, when the Canadians came to Toronto, there was a buzz in the city. But Montreal didn't feel it when they swept Toronto in four games. I didn't really get that same feeling with the, the Toronto-Montreal rivalry when we played them in the playoffs. They played again in the 79 playoffs. But Montreal's dominance kept the once great rivalry from rekindling. To develop a rivalry, you can't be all one-sided, of course. But I, I know the rivalry was there, you felt it, you wanted to win badly against a team as good as them. In Toronto, the Leafs' pain and frustration grew as they watched their former rival leave them behind. Harold Ballard looked to the Canadians to improve his team. He pursued Scotty Bowman. I didn't feel comfortable. I, I knew that Toronto was a top franchise, but um, I guess coming and playing in Montreal, coaching in Montreal, it just didn't seem the place for me to go. That's why I went to Buffalo. Now desperate, Ballard rehired Punch Imlach. Imlach's moves backfired. I don't think the Leafs recovered from that, you know. Some of the trades weren't uh, very sound. Uh, in any uh, uh, sport to have a successful team, there has to be a, a chemistry and a, and a bond. But there was none under Imlac. Morale sunk. The team's leader resigned his captaincy. My whole ambition and goal as a player was to try to win a cup and, and do the best I can to help the Leafs, my teammates, and, and I was a very, very loyal person all the way through that. Nothing worked. So in 1981, in a move shrouded in mystery, an aging, frustrated Harold Ballard moved his Maple Leafs to the weak Norris division. It was a sad moment for hockey's greatest rivalry. Made sadder when the move did nothing to help Toronto's fortunes. In fact, the team got worse. The fans felt betrayed, and young hockey players abandoned their dreams of one day wearing the jersey of the Maple Leafs. We began to hear players telling the Leafs, don't draft me. Boy, that hurt. As the years passed, so too did the hope. As Harold continued to get older, I and mean, he wouldn't let go of the reins of the hockey club, he was the owner, but yet his health was failing, probably his, his capabilities of making uh, proper sound decisions were failing at times. The Leafs were a spectacle of scandal. You don't usually go to bed with people who cause you a lot of trouble. Don't start that camera going. Why the hell don't you get some brains in and think for yourself? There's nobody around here has a heart. He wanted things done his way and I want things done my way. I wouldn't give him for, even uh, Turnbull away for God. You might learn that they're not mucking around with some guy that's a uh, softy. Boya Salmi will never be traded as long as I'm around here. And you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Places for sale, if they got enough money, they can have it. How much? A million dollars a share. Go on. Even a dear old friend was hurt by it all. He had Clance, King Clancy uh, as a, a kind of a gopher for him. Um, Clancy, Clancy would be affirmative on if, if they suggested blowing up the gardens. I'm sure Clancy would have said, OK, boss. King Clancy's death in 1986 had a profound effect on Harold Ballard. With his own health deteriorating, it wasn't long before he followed King. His legacy secure. They went 18 years of, of downhill. Uh, he, he was, uh, he, 
He ruined a, a wonderful franchise. Though the rivalry had suffered badly in the 80s, the Canadians excelled. Management's foresight kept Montreal sharply focused on the future. The Toronto Maple Leafs are very happy to select Wendell Clark from Saskatoon. Toronto's run of poor seasons brought the team a series of high draft picks. With Wendell Clark, a powerful force was added. The Leafs strive to end what was by now a national disgrace. While Montreal honored their past, the mystique was revealed in the men who are the Canadians. 64, Mr. Frank J. Selke, Sr. Their history is for all of Canada to share. Montreal Canadian was so important for all the sportsmen in Quebec, and even outside Quebec. I never thought, you know, that the Canadian meant so much to all those people. In the absence of the Leafs, the void was filled by Quebec's Nordique. As hockey's great rivalry entered the 90s, the games evoked an intensity that was reminiscent of the past. For each team, there would always be a need to beat the other. The rivalry's passion endured. What had been created could never die. Today, the rivalry between the Leafs and the Canadians' hopes is still alive. My dad was a, a Leaf fan, my brothers were Leaf fans, and uh, there was something about the Montreal Canadiens that, uh, as a kid, I took an attraction to, liked. Uh, Jean Beliveau was my idol uh, all the way through uh, uh, his career and my career growing up, and uh, the Canadians were my team. And then the day I was drafted by the Leafs in 1970, June of 70, uh, I switched allegiances quickly, obviously, but uh, I also felt very fortunate as a young kid growing up in Ontario that uh, I had the opportunity to, to play with the Leafs, play with them for 11 and a half seasons and, uh, and be close to home. And, uh, and I guess no one understand what uh, Hockey Night in Canada uh, means to most Canadians. And uh, well, that was a blessing for me. The spring of 1993 suggested the Leafs were back. And so nearly was the first Montreal-Toronto Stanley Cup final in almost 30 years. But for Wayne Gretzky, the Leafs and Canadians would have renewed hockey's storied rivalry. As it was, Montreal won an incredible 10 straight overtime games to capture a record 24th Cup. Now more than double Toronto's 11. Ironically, improved leaf fortunes traced to an executive who started with the Canadians. Cliff Fletcher inherited what success could never buy. The fans love for a team. It's probably the only professional sports franchise in North America that could go through a decade of having what was the worst record in the National Hockey League and uh, sell out every game. A return to Maple Leaf tradition would be invaluable. You can have all the money in the world or all the marketing expertise, but you can't buy or manufacture tradition in history. The renewal began with the homecoming of a former captain. To achieve and go to the next level, you should always recognize the past and the people who gave their their lives, their careers uh, to an organization, achieved uh, recognizing them. Uh, we're doing that now. The Maple Leafs know the key to their future lies in the past. If you're a young guy out on that ice standing on the blue line playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs and you see this going on, you're saying this is a place I want to play. <laughs> For decades, many young Canadians dreamed of the day they might skate with the Maple Leafs. Although only a handful of the current team was even born the last time champagne was sipped in 1967. They know the building, the banners, the names. They are a living part of a great tradition. On just one night in a long season, the rival 
enters the gardens. The red, white, and blue have come to town. The Canadians are no longer just the flying Frenchmen. But as the language in the dressing room changes to suit the times, one thing remains constant. An undeniable rivalry. Let's get those leaves, eh? All right. Toronto-Montreal games are still unlike any other. It is the passion of the fans that now carries the great rivalry. Dressed with allegiances declared, it is apparent to all there are two home teams tonight. The excitement in the stands isn't lost on the players. They know there's much more at stake than two points in the standings. The building burns bright with the colors of the rivals. The largest TV audience of the year looks in when the Canadians meet the Maple Leafs. For most hockey fans, it is an evening that comes with great anticipation. A date noted in the calendar. Each moment safer. Electricity abounds. When they play, I cannot get over the, the atmosphere in the building, either in Toronto or in Montreal. Even if it is only for a few hours, the rivalry comes alive. The play generates excitement on the ice that is missing on some nights. Now, more than 50 years since Frank Selke's move to Montreal drew the battle lines, the competition lives on. The fans were split up and it was a, you, could, you could feel that uh, uh, the rivalry was still there. Inevitably, the game is close. The emotions flare. That's when the intensity rises. Obviously, playing against Toronto and Montreal, the rivalry in the, from the original six days, it's there. It's going to heat up no matter what. With Leafs Canadians game so rare now, each comes with greater significance. A night to remind us of what was once and the chance to reflect on what should be. A loss to Montreal always hurts more. But the Maple Leafs, undaunted, press on. The team continues to search for the winning chemistry so prevalent in its glorious past. In Montreal, the past is always present. After more than 70 years, the closing of Montreal's Forum this night does not come without some reservation. Memories can linger when the past touches the future, but before the doors finally swing shut, there is one last game to be played. I had a message for them <coughs> that, uh, that I had yesterday from the old timers that they told me to tell the players that uh, they have to win. The young Canadians know the future is their responsibility. Generations of Canadians have returned to the Forum one last time. So potent is their legacy, the stars of yesterday remain heroes today. Fans keep vigil, privately treasuring each moment. When the Canadians emerge, everyone in the building understands they are part of something special. 
there is never any doubt the game will be won. It is a night that can never end, though the celebration contains a tinge of sorrow. When an endless parade of champions step back onto the forum ice, they are regaled by thunderous ovation. The young Canadian players begin to understand their duty when the great rocket is introduced. I think all the kids were looking with the big eyes, and I was too, but I think for them, for the first experience in Montreal, they saw what it meant to be a Montreal Canadian. It was really interesting to see a lot of the uh, uh, European players. They just didn't really know all about the Montreal Canadiens, and I think really that night really hit home. The applause for Rocket Richard was endless. What an emotional night for everybody, including myself. And the Rocket, you know, when he gets that eight or nine minutes standing ovation, it's something that you jamais vu. I don't think you'll ever see that in sports again. Maurice Richard has come to embody all that is a Montreal Canadian. It felt funny on the ice. I didn't know what to think. and uh, It made me cry a little bit, no doubt about that. Uh, six, seven minutes of ovation. I never had that in my life. When the torch appears, as always, it's held high. Passed from hand to hand, scores of memories ignite along with it. Together, the Montreal Canadiens proudly embrace the future. It's hard to imagine that bricks and mortar could affect lives so profoundly. But that was the Montreal Forum. In Montreal, uh, we had great owners. The Molson family has been great, great owners to the Montreal Canadiens. And, and for them and their great hockey fan, the Senator Eric and Stephen Molson, and the other family before. And against, they had just as much pressure from the public than we had on the ice. Montreal's new Molson Center is now home to the Canadian. With a new building comes a new era. A host of memories wait. The Montreal Canadiens ensure tradition will always be with them. With their heroes aloft, the Canadiens dare themselves to be champions once more. Maple Leafs look within and find pride again. The team now has a vision. There's definitely going to be a new Maple Leaf Gardens or a new facility for the Maple Leafs to play hockey in. Uh, in, in the 1990s, leading as we go towards the 21st century, it's absolutely necessary. One building going, the other gone. The Leafs and Canadians have played each other now 
for 70 years. They fashioned a rivalry like no other in sport. The men pitted against one another will never forget. Between Montreal and Toronto, it was, it was a real battle every night. Every time we met, you know, it really was. They were on the same train as us, and uh, it was just about fights. Uh, every two minutes, guys walking through our trailer. Let's get them tonight. It's French Canada. It's Montreal, it's the Habs, and, and we're in Toronto. It's always uh, nice to beat the Toronto Maple Leaf. And I think it's the same thing for them, coming to Montreal and being able to play a good game against us. So the tradition continues, and it's the one thing that's constant in hockey. The emotional energy that goes out in a Montreal Canadiens and Toronto Maple Leaf hockey game is fabulous, and that part hasn't changed. There is too little left of hockey's greatest rivalry. With its past still vibrant, and its passion deep. Hockey waits patiently for its eventual return. We've lost something. Those of us who have long enough memories can appreciate what it was like then. I just think Toronto and Montreal, not to have their old games, is just simply ridiculous. Even now, we only play the Canadians maybe once a year in your own building, sometimes twice, and, uh, and people you can't get tickets for those games. People hang on them, they want to be there. If Toronto would, would be in our division, I think the, the rivalry would be more present. I think the commissioner is aware of the importance uh, of sustaining the rivalry between Montreal and Toronto, and I look forward to some sort of realignment uh, that would parallel the next expansion that would see us uh, play Montreal uh, far more frequently. There was nothing that could compare with a Montreal Canadians Toronto Maple Leaf rivalry and uh, man hockey's missed that and hockey needs that rivalry again.